Chris, you, you've, you've written a really fascinating article, you know, called The Myth of the Free Press. Uh, just right off the top, you know, what is the myth of the free press? Could you explain the myth to us? The myth is that the press is not fettered, uh, that there are no parameters, that it can say whatever it wants, that it can speak truth to power. In fact, the parameters are extremely narrow, especially, for instance, on issues of national security. I worked for 15 years for the New York Times and the unofficial motto of the New York Times is we will not significantly alienate those uh, on whom we depend for money, which is our advertisers, or access, which are the powerful. Now you can alienate them sometimes, but you better not make a habit of it. What we're seeing is our green jobs are turning into orange jumpsuit jobs. Uh, a little known provision in federal law is that uh, allows uh, prisoners to manufacture products and requires that the federal government buy from those sources if there is a prison industry manufacturing something. They already manufacture furniture and vehicle components, which are two key industries in Michigan, as well as textiles. But now they're beginning to uh, make crystalline cells, which is uh, a, a component used to convert light to electric current in the solar industry. Obviously, with our growing solar industry in Michigan, this is a, a real problem for us because uh, they obviously don't have to pay wages anywhere near the level that the private sector does. And it requires that the federal government buy from them, even if they're not the best source with the highest quality and other factors. While the rest of the U.S. may be struggling for work, there's currently a real boom of job offers for inmates in the country. Both state and some of the biggest private companies are now enjoying the fruits of a cheap and readily available workforce with tens of millions of dollars spent by private prisons to keep their jails full. Between 1970 and 2005, the US's prison population grew by a massive 700%, far outpacing both population growth and crime rates. <laughs> Today, it's got to the stage where America is home to 5% of the world's population, but a quarter of the world's prisoners. And not only does America have the highest imprisonment rates of any country in the entire world, but it also has the highest rate of youth incarceration. Over 130,000 juveniles are detained in the US every year, and on any given day, there are more than 70,000 youths in detention. But the biggest winners of this mass incarceration haven't been the American public, but the private prison companies who are making giant profits out of people being in jail. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, in 2010, the two largest prison companies alone received nearly $3 billion in revenue, while their top executives each received annual compensation packages worth more than $3 million. Well, few Americans truly understand our prison system. Even fewer realize that within the walls of prisons across America, an entire workforce has been developed, one that works for third world wages and actually accrues massive amounts of debt, debt that can send someone back to prison even if they've served their time. Earlier this week, I spoke with author and journalist Chris Hedges, and I began by asking him to give me a basic understanding of some of these misconceptions that we have about America's prison complex. We have 25% of the world's prison population and 5% of the world's population. Um, so prisoners under the 13th Amendment uh, essentially work as in a form of neo-slavery for about $1.30 a day. Uh, we are seeing huge numbers of for-profit corporations from Chevron to Victoria's Secret to Target to Hewlett Packard uh, use or exploit uh, prison labor. Uh, we have seen private corporations now become predatory within prison walls, uh, phone companies charging 15 cents a minute, uh, forcing you to prepay your plans with very high surcharges. Uh, you know, you pay $10, you got to pay $3 to the phone company. Uh, the privatization of commissaries where prices have risen by over 100%. I have a list of the 1996 commissary prices in New Jersey and the ones today uh, and uh, things have, uh, in almost every case, at least doubled. I mean, for instance, uh, if you want to buy an envelope, they sell them singularly, uh, it costs you 15 cents, 
Uh, if you buy a hundred pack of uh, legal size envelopes, it's seven dollars. That, of course, is more than double in price. Uh, fines that are uh, levied uh, at the time of sentencing that, and remember, these people are making twenty-eight dollars a month. Uh, they're working eight hours a day. Uh, it takes them forever to pay their fines off. Uh, let, let me jump the, in there for a second because yeah. um, I, I want to get some details on some of this. You're giving me a lot of information, but let's go back for a minute to what you said about corporations, major corporations in, in the United States. And you give a long list here, including Starbucks, right. AT&T, Microsoft, right. Procter & Gamble, Wendy's. How are those corporations using the prison populations as a workforce? How does that happen? Well, they move behind prison walls. Uh, we have most of, uh, you know, military uniforms, uh, vests, canteens, all of which is made by federal prisoners. Um, you know, this is, it's forced labor, uh, and it's massive, and it, it's extremely profitable, uh, which is part of the problem uh, of mass incarceration, because we have corporations and the lobbyists for those corporations writing these draconian laws to keep people locked behind bars for decades for crimes that, uh, in other countries, they might not even be arrested for. I mean, half of the prison population never committed a violent crime. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Other destroying each other, wars, competing for material existence, raping the planet and tearing it apart to get some pieces of it to hold in your hands and say you won the game. Every one of those moves is destructive, not just of the planet, but of human civilization. Because human civilization will thrive with cooperation and will die with competition. And if you operate from these truths, then you end up with the extinction that lies before us. Let's look at the forms of law that we currently acquiesce to. A common misconception among people is that any rule or regulation that governs them falls under one category law. But there are many other forms of law that people abide by without realizing that they simply do not apply to them. Another misconception is that a nation's constitution gives us our rights. A constitution does nothing more than list the rights that we already have. We are born with inalienable rights, endowed to us by our Creator. They are not given to us and they cannot be given away. The most a person can do with a right is choose whether to exercise it or not. Maritime Admiralty Law is what's known as the Law of the Water. It is superseded by civil law and only applies to those who willingly contract themselves into it. The definition of Admiralty Law is a body of private international law governing the relationships between private entities which operate vessels on the oceans. Let's look at how and why a form of law that is fashioned to govern corporations, businesses, and vessels has imposed its rule over natural human beings. This is all done through a form of word magic. A simple perversion of language has made it possible to convince people around the world that these alternative laws apply to them. One of the predominant beliefs in modern culture is that licenses, permits, registrations, and other forms of documentation are required to operate motor vehicles, use public roads, build structures and establishments, engage in free enterprise, and much more. Sadly, these beliefs are based on little to no investigation whatsoever, and are false. This belief structure is perpetuated by maritime admiralty law. This form of law was originally created to govern ships docking in foreign nations for the import or export of products and resources. It deals with banking and merchant affairs, not civil affairs. When a product is taken off of a ship and brought into a foreign land, that nation takes custody of the resource and accounts for it with a certificate. That certificate marks the birth date of that product in the custody of the respective nation. Think of why it is supposedly required to have a certificate of live birth in the first place. 
The Barron's Dictionary of Banking Terms defines a certificate as a paper establishing an ownership claim. So right there, we notice that everyone with a birth certificate is defined as being owned. People are used as collateral with other nations because the U.S. is bankrupt. The United States declared bankruptcy on March 9th of 1933. At this point, the U.S. began taking out loans from a private, non-government affiliated corporation called the Federal Reserve. With no money to pay back the loans, the United States began using the citizens as collateral. All birth and marriage certificates are literally warehouse receipts. Just look at the similarities of warehouse receipts and birth certificates. Both document the date of issue, a serial number, registration number or receipt number, a description of the product, and an authorized informant to notify the appropriate government agency. With all of this information being readily available, the majority of people are unaware of their involvement with maritime admiralty law. This is possible through the manipulation of language. This admiralty law changed the meaning of the word person from a natural living person to a corporation. Driver's licenses, vehicle registrations, auto insurance forms, building permits, gun permits, work permits, tax filing documents, birth and death certificates, traffic citations, and many other forms of documentation that were once believed to be absolutely necessary only apply to persons or corporations. Upon signing such a legal document, you are indirectly waiving your rights under the Constitution and lowering your status to that of a corporation that is created with the same exact name as you. The only way to reconcile your true name from the name of the corporation is to take notice that the corporation has its name in all capital letters. This is known as Capitus Diminutia Maxima. You may take notice that your driver's license, birth certificate, social security card, insurance cards, and more use all capital letters to legally represent the corporation with your name, not you. The corporation is known as an artificial person, whereas you, the human being, are known as a natural person. This deception goes even deeper when it comes to the courts that we attend. When showing up the court, you will notice that there are seats for witnesses behind a wooden fence or barrier. The defendant must cross through the entrance to the other side of the barrier where the plaintiff and judge sit. This act symbolizes the boarding of a ship. At this time, business can be conducted in maritime admiralty law. The judge, acting as captain or banker, is responsible for settling the balance between the two sides. This is why there is always a monetary value involved in any court case. The captain is simply dealing with banking and merchant disputes. Once the balance is paid, the case is closed. To turn the court case away from admiralty law where your rights are not protected, you must avoid agreeing to represent the artificial person. This is done by stating that you are the natural person. You don't have a first or last name because those imply corporate title. In a court case, you may state that the court takes judicial notice of your honor's oath of office. Every judge must take an oath of office to practice law, yet you must make it clear to the court and the jury that the judge is acting as judge and not banker. Remember that you are a natural human being of the earth. You are not governed by anything but your own consciousness. Laws are created within a society. The society that created the laws we see being enforced today is called the Law Society. Yet the most beautiful part of this entire deception is the fact that we are not part of the Law Society, so their laws do not apply to us.